Okay, I think I'm going to start now. So welcome to the journey through a happy path. I didn't expect this crowd to be so large, but okay. Um, but before we get going, yes? Okay. Give me just a few minutes to introduce myself because I'm not as famous as some other speakers like, like Michelangelo. So my name is Nikola Posha. I'm a web developer and software architect specializing in PHP-driven applications and web services. I am very passionate about open source. I wrote several um, libraries that I actively maintain, and I'm also a contributor on a few other open source projects as well, like Zen Framework, for example. I work for a company called Arbor Education. More specifically, it's engineering department called Arbor Labs. And our main product is information system for schools, educational institutions, which give you the idea of how vast and complex that domain is. But it's um, challenging and it's fun, yeah. I'm also a member of the PHP Serbia local user group and I'm co-organizing PHP Serbia conference. And therefore, I'm happy to in, um, invite you to join us next year in Belgrade, Serbia. I promise a great event. Um, so, some of you have probably realized that the word unhappy in the title of this talk was there to remind you of a much more familiar um, phrase in software development, which is a happy path, which by definition is a default scenario in application execution, right? In, in which everything works as expected. It's also called a normal flow. And to give you the idea of, of what I mean, let's start with an example right away in an application, web application, website on which authors can write their articles. So with regard to, 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 to articles, we have this concrete article repository implementation, DB article repository, because I've decided to, to store articles in, in SQL database. And like every repository, there is this find by ID method, which is a typical for repositories, right? So, uh, and that find by ID method is um, querying articles DB table and creates an article entity based on the resulting record. Very simple, yeah. But what can, what can possibly go wrong here, right, with this code? Many things. Um, database might not be accessible for, for whatever reason, right? But the most obvious problem that I see with this code is that it is this bold assumption, right, that the article record will always exist because some way may pass some non-existing ID in the input. So all that, um, sorry, leads us to what is known as exceptional behavior, so which um, breaks the, the normal flow after some exceptional condition is met. It often changes the, the normal flow of program execution. So the question is, how do we solve this? As you see, I'm using Doctrine DBL to facilitate communication with database, and it, and it, and it returns Boolean false when this fetch associate method does not return nothing. So how do we fix it? What do we put in it? What do we return? What do we do? Um, to make this method still works. Well, um, the first solution that developers usually resort to is that they return now from methods, right? But that's the easiest solution, yeah? You can do that. But in my opinion, that's the worst thing you can do, right? Um, so first thing, you should know is that you should never return null from methods. Not only nulls, but um, any other odd return value, like, like return codes, for which your consumer uh, probably won't be prepared for. So you're gonna end up with flood of repeated null checks, and only one missing null, checks, null check can have disastrous consequences. And I'm not the the, the one who, who came up with that idea, right? I just agree with something that was stated long before me by some prominent experts in our field, like 
Uncle Bob, for example, in his famous book, Clean Code. Who didn't read this book? Okay. And of all you, you, you claim you did, I hope you, you didn't miss this chapter in which he says that when we re return now, we are essentially creating work for ourselves and foisting problems upon our colors. Okay? What he also says is that all it takes is one missing null check to get an application spinning out of control. How many times you've seen this? Yeah? Okay? In other languages, this phenomenon is known as a null pointer exception. So, but Uncle Bob does not only criticize, right? He suggests solutions to the problems. So what he suggests is that instead of returning now, we should consider um, throwing an exception or returning a special case object. Let's examine both alternatives. So first al alternative is to throw a meaningful exception as part of your API contract and guide the consumer instead of returning some values for which he probably won't be prepared for. Now, the consumer can basically only focus on this interface to know how to use our method. He doesn't have to dig into implementation in search for um, return codes or nulls, right? Also notice that we can now safely put this return type hint back, which is something you cannot do if you return null, because null introduces ambiguity, right? And that's bad. So another alternative is special case. A special case is a design pattern that was described by Martin Fowler in his famous book, um, Patterns of, Ap of Enterprise Application Architecture. So by its definition, a special case is a subclass that provides special behavior for particular cases. Let's see what it means. So you create a special case object that exhibits some default behavior. In our example, I decided to, to create this dead article object, which overrides get title and get content methods with some meaningful values for the case I have in my application. And sure, I could have called this non-existing article or something like that, but this is a terminology that, 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 that we're all kind of familiar with, like, right? Dead link, dead article, that type of stuff. And after that, you return that special case object that has the, the same interface as what the caller e expects. And consequently, you can get rid of all those ugly null checks in your application, like for example, in your template. And um, so <laughs> the, another thing that Uncle Bob says about nulls, because he obviously hates nulls, is that returning null from methods is bad, but passing null into methods is much worse. In PHP, passing null into methods is, only, is possible only if the code allows it. Take a look at this example. This is a different domain now, so some e-shop, e-commerce application, in which we have this order object con consisting of a product that the customer is buying. And one of the business requirements with this application was that an order has, can have an optional discount. And a developer reading his Jira task, when he saw that business requirement, he literally transferred that to his code. And to give you the idea of what a discount is, is this premium discount is Apple, which when applied to a price, it cuts off the price by 50%. So, how do we fix this? Because, as a consequence, again, when you have optional dependencies, optional parameters, you again have to deal with nulls. So you're gonna have, you're gonna have this ugly null check inside the get total method, which, which calculates the total price of an order, right? So the solution is simple. Make everything mandatory, right? Um, make all the parameters required. 
But what should we do now in this case? What should we pass into this object? Um, sorry. Special case to the rescue, right? So you, so you simply create a no discount object, which when applied to a price, simply does nothing. And you create order object with it. Simple, yeah. So the bottom line is do not mess with null. Do not return null from methods. Do not accept null in methods. Now introduces ambiguity, remember that. Um, you're going to end up with flood of repeated null checks, and thereby you're increasing risk of fatal errors. So now the question is whether you should use special case or exception. Well, as we've seen, special case can remedy most of the exceptional conditions, right? Um, but drawing an exception, some in uh, some situations is a desired behavior when you want to emphasize violated business logic rule. But you should know that exceptions stop uh, program execution, leading which causes error conditions. So let's talk about exceptions now in the continuation of this talk. I'm going to be focusing on exceptions and error handling in particular. Um, but before that, examples of um, business logic rules violation that I mentioned as one of the use cases for, for, for throwing exception. For example, when a user is created in our system, we, we want to make sure that um, its email address is valid. Data existence validation. If you remember this example from the beginning, now in my application, there is a business rule that says article must exist. So where do I enforce that rule? Well, how I do things is that on a repository level, notice also that the semantics of these two methods is different. Find, find something or nothing versus get, get me something or break. So how I do things is that on a repository level, I return special case objects. And on a service layer, so at the higher layer operation, I enforce business rules. So I'm um, complaining as loud as I can at that level. I'm throwing exceptions at that level. So how do we use exceptions? Should be simple, right? Just throw a predefined exception and you're done. But that's not how you do things, right? You can do better than that. You can try harder. It's not that simple. Um, so first thing you do is that you create custom exception types. Three key benefits of having custom exception types. They bring semantics to your code. They emphasize the exception type or the message, right? Because throwing around same exception type does not make sense unless you read the message. Also, they allow um, a caller to act differently based on exception type. So how do you structure except exceptions? You usually keep them under exception namespace and the directory that has the same name, right? And what's important is that there should, there can and should be multiple exception types for every module or a component in your system, whether it's an application or a library. How do you create exception classes? Well, for their names, be descriptive as possible. Use exception as a suffix by convention. I say convention because some people argue that that um, suffix is excessive, it's not needed. But I'm still not confident enough to omit it. I don't know, what about you? Um, as for um, exception class that you should inherit from, it's all about the semantical meaning that you want to achieve. Because uh, now that you are decided to create custom exception types, it really doesn't matter whether you're, you're going to in, inherit this particular exception from the base exception class or logic exception if that particular exception is intended for developers, for example. So um, 
Next thing that is important about exceptions is that they are cohesive, meaning that they do not violate single resp re responsibility principle, right? This example over here is an example of a bad exception class because it is too general in kind, right? Ideally, you should be creating exception class for every exceptional condition that you have in your application, okay? Component level exception type. It's a very important technique. Why? Because that's an exception type that can be called for any exception that emanates from a certain component. It is accomplished by using marker interface design pattern. And it's a best practice for library code, but it also makes sense in applications, in projects. This is the way you accomplish it. So you simply create this empty interface, which is why it was called a marker interface, and you have all your exceptions in particular module implemented. What this allows for is that caller gets any number of opportunities to catch any exception from um, your module, from a given component. For example, Guzzle is a great example of that, of using that approach. Who doesn't know what Guzzle is? We all know what Guzzle is, right? HTTP client library. So this particular class over here is actually an interface, a marker interface. These are some concrete exceptions over here. And what this allows me is that if I have some code that is using Guzzle, I can handle client exceptions in one way, server exceptions the other way, or any other Guzzle exceptions some way. So very, very useful technique, remember. Formatting exception messages. So when you throw an exception, you, you throw it with some message, right? And formatting logic in place where you throw exceptions can be very um, distracting, can be noisy, right? Like this one, for example, when you're doing some, some, some formatting, some, some as print app. And if that's not convincing enough, take a look at this, for example. So not only that, that, that you have formatting in place, but also some method invocations on an object or on an entity. So what we do is that we encapsulate formatting logic into exception classes themselves by using named constructors technique, very important technique. I use it not only for exceptions, but for many other objects as well in my system, like entities. By a convention, so, so, so you create this um, static method, which are by a convention prefixed with, with this for um, word, like, so when you're throwing exception, for what? For some input, right? For anything, for, 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 for anything in that particular um, context. And as a result, um, when you throw an exception, you throw it this way. So throw article not found exception for what? For ID. It's almost like you're reading a sentence, right? And that's how code should be. Readable, expressive, right? And um, of all the things we've been through in this talk and then that, that you're gonna see, this particular technique is something that I would like you to, to take home with you and to start uh, practicing it, then I would be which will make me happy that I um, transfer some knowledge to you. So, very important technique. But there's more. Providing a context. So now you're taking advantage of a named constructor's technique to save and expose the context of the exceptional situation that has happened. For example, when you throw that article not found exception, someone might be in interesting in that ID value, right? And you don't want to make that person have to parse that message in search for an ID. So you preserve it when you throw it, right? And expose it with a simple getter method. So don't be afraid to put some new properties to put some new methods into custom exception classes, put some behavior into them. So, very useful technique. 
exception wrapping. So is used for wrapping exceptions that comes from a lower layer operations into some mean, into exceptions that are meaningful for the higher layer operation. What does that mean? Example. Imagine that you're building some um, API SDK API client. We all did that, right? And you're using Guzzle internally. Um, I don't want to for my consumer to know that I'm using Guzzle at all. I don't want my consumer to have to deal with Guzzle exceptions, right? Because the level of the abstraction my library deals with is API. It's not HTTP, right? I don't want my um, consumer of my library have to, to deal with errors like HTTP communication failed at port 80 because that, that's not the domain of my library. Domain of my library is API and resources on it, right? So you wrap all the exceptions into, so ideally any exception that gets emanated as a consequence of using your library should belong to, to, to your library, right? So what you do is you wrap that exception into your exception, but also it's good that you preserve that previous error that happened. And I'm taking advantage of what's built in PHP, which is this one, two, three, third <coughs> argument of the base exception class constructor, and it has that get previous method on it. Um, so to, to sum up this part of the talk, create custom cohesive exception types. Don't be lazy, don't throw predefined exceptions. Introduce component level exception type using marker interface. Encapsulate message formatting logic into exception classes themselves using um, named constructors technique. Very important, if you remember. Save, provide context of the exceptional condition, the exceptional situation. And apply exception wrapping technique when writing libraries. I find this last technique useful only for libraries. I don't see its value in, in, in projects, in applications. But you should know how it works anyway. So now you must be thinking, hey, these exemptions are so complicated, why do I have to put so much effort into it, right? You thought that it is simple, just throw an exception, right? But the thing is, if you're a software architect building maintainable software, exceptions are inevitable and equal part of your architecture. So you should treat them how you treat any other part of your code, okay? So, um, now that we know how to throw exceptions, how to provoke error conditions, let's see how do we handle them in a process of responding and recovering from error conditions. Challenges in implementing solid and robust error handling system are various, so it should cover different ways of using application. We're going to see what that means. It needs to provide just enough details to be useful for users, but at the, the same time, it needs to suppress some error details that are not intended for users, like, like some sensitive information that may appear in errors, right? And it also needs to collect as much as data as possible to be useful for maintainers, us, right, developers. So you need some logging mechanism built in it. So. What options do we have? Inline error handling, right? The first option. But it usually leads to maintenance difficulties, code duplication, right? Because ideally, we want to be managing everything from a single place. Sure, for, for some exceptions that you want to process in a specific way, for example, user not leak, um, user not logged in, when that exception is raised, you maybe want to redirect user to some other page. So you, so, so you handle it inline. But most of the time, you're going to be handling exceptions the same way. 
to render it, to show it to the user. So MVC frameworks offers error controls, right? All the errors get forwarded to it. And it allows for handling errors from a single place. That's what we want to, right? With the adoptions of new concepts, new technologies, we have error middlewares in middleware frameworks, which are set as the outermost middleware, meaning that um, any other middleware, middleware that is stacked over here can be catched with a single try-catch block, which is outermost middleware around the entire middleware stack, so you can handle all the errors from a single place, from a single point. Nice. But all these solutions kind of ignore the fact that our application can be used in different ways, through different ports. When I say port, I mean that your application may have web user interface, right? It may have command line interface. It may also have API, right? So the, the, the error handling should support all that. You don't want to have three error handling implementations, right? So what we should do is that we should um, embrace central error handler as a concept, which wraps the entire system to, to handle any uncaught exceptions. It is a unique and uniform solution which, which covers different ways of using our application, which is what we want. And it's framework agnostic, which is very important, which is what I like, right? Um, meaning that I can reuse that error handling system between the projects. You can build your own by overriding PHP's default error handler, so both error and, and exception handler. Or you can decide to use some of the existing solutions, some of the existing third-party libraries. One of them is Whoops. Who has heard of Whoops? Okay. The other is Bubu. Who has heard of this one? That's what I thought. Okay. The Whoops is very popular. I think that, that, that it is very popular in the lateral ecosystem. But the problem with Whoops it is, is that I'm not a fan of its design because for, for, for some things it is very hard to extend it and to customize it to build some things, to, to, to put some things in it that I expect from an error handling system. Bubu has a different problem. It has a better, it has a better design. But the problem with Bubu is that it's not actively maintained. Bubu is actually um, part of the League um, group of packages, if you heard about League. Um, it was like two months ago or something, they released something after two and a half years. I mean, so for that reason, I'm going to use Whoops in examples. So how do you use Whoops? Is that you build it, you configure it, you, you push what is called a handler in its terminology onto it. And a handler is supposed to either um, emit exception, like this handler that are provided by, by whoops, or you can do any kind of processing of the exception that has happened. So, and the way I use whoops is as like any other service in my application. I create a factory for it. And for the sake of simplicity, I'm using this utility method also provided by Whoops to determine in which context I am, right? So I'm conditionally adding a, either JSON response handler, command line handler, handler, or this pretty page handler, which is what makes Whoops so popular, right? But you can also create um, custom handlers. I'm going to dig into more details about this one soon. So one for setting proper HTTP status code and log handler. And when you configure Whoops, somewhere in your bootstrapping logic, you initialize it, right? You invoke, I pick it up from a dependency injection container, and I invoke this register method on it, which registers 
listeners or default PHP PHP handlers. So now Whoops is um, listening for all the exception that uh, not get caught that 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 propagate to it, and you can you are including that same Bootstrap in both web application document root and the command line um, entry point. So you have a setup working in every context of your application. You are having a uniform error handling system enabled for every context in your application. Now let's see those um, custom handlers that I've made. One is for logging, right? I mentioned logging as something that should be part of every good error handling system, right? So I'm using for this handler um, PSR3 logger, right, to, because I want to log errors that happen. But I'm, I don't want to be logging every exception, right? I'm not interested in, in, in logging some um, client errors, for example. I want to log only errors that are, are possible bugs in my system. So how do I determine which errors I should be logging and I should not? Yes, you could have some big list of exception types that, that you don't want to be logging. But I'm always going for a dynamic solution, right? So I've introduced this interface that, I don't know what happened now, but part of the code is missing. Anyway, I'm introducing this marker interface, which is empty. Again, I'm using marker interface technique to determine which exceptions I should be logging or not. Also, for setting HTTP status code, Similar things. You can either have a big map of exception types and appropriate um, HTTP status code. Again, I'm using a dynamic approach by introducing this interface that every exception can implement to provide appropriate status code. Now, why I'm showing this to you is that to realize what possibilities you have in order to create a robust, a dynamic error handling system by putting behavior into exception classes themselves, right? Um, like I said, Whoops is not ideal. I like its design. Bubu has some other issues. So I started looking for alternatives. And a colleague of mine has started working on this project, we code in slash error handling, uh, which is a very unconventional design, as you're gonna see it, but it kind of um, mitigates and fixes all the shortcomings of both Whoops and Bubu. It's a still work in progress, okay? So don't expect that it is still stable and, and everything, but I suggest you take a look at it and contribute new ideas to it, why not? Last but not least, um, don't forget to test exceptional behavior. Perform negative testing. Um, make sure that your application is doing well in that unhappy path that is capable of, of, of handling improper user input. And I don't want to get into details with this. I just want to shed some light on how you test exceptions in particular. So PHP units offer this handy expect exception method, right? That you set before acting on a method that can emit exception. Alternatively, you can use annotation that has the same name. But in testing, there is a um, pattern for um, arranging and formatting test code called arrange, act, assert. It is consisted of these three steps. And if you attended Sebastian's talk yesterday, right? He was speaking that um, Test code should also be cared, 
should, should be treated with care, should be clean, should be readable. Um, so I also said that um, it should be consistent. So to show you what I mean, your test code most of the time naturally follows arrange, act, assert um, pattern. How? So first you initialize object that you're testing, right? Then you act on it, right? Invoke some method that you're testing, and then you perform verifications, right? Assertions. Exceptions should be no different, right? That's why I think that um, th that's that consistency part I was talking about. It requires a, re a little bit more hassle, right? But at least it keeps my test code consistent, right? Initialization phase, active phase, assertions, one after the another. So if you remember, with using expect exception, you are doing assertion be before you do act, right? So I'm going to wrap everything up with saying that um, all the things we've been to um, relate to a practice called defensive programming, which is an approach for improving software quality in terms of reducing chances of bugs, um, making code readable, um, comprehensible, making it behave in a predictable manner, right? But what we did is that we've taken some, some uh, countermeasures, some precautions that um, completely eliminate the effort, or at least to some extent, for doing defensive programming. For example, coding defensively against nulls is one of the key techniques in defensive programming. And what we did, we decided to avoid nulls at any cost, so you are thereby completely eliminating the effort for coding defensively against nulls, okay? Also, we decided for a consistent um, strategy for dealing with exceptional conditions. If you remember that example in which I decided to raise exceptions on a service layer and return special case objects on a repository layer. Also, we decided to complain as loud as we can about errors in our application. So our domain liberally raises exceptions that get caught on by our robust central error handling system. So that in particular is a um, feature of a, a, another uh, technique called offensive programming, which is considered to be a subcategory of defensive programming, but with an added emphasis that certain errors should not be handled defensively. So what we did is that we are doing defensive programming but using offensive countermeasures. And before I say thank you, I would like you, I would kindly ask you to rate my talk at joined in, but not only to um, rate it, but to give me feedback on how I performed on the stage, what you like, what you didn't about this talk, give me advice of how can I improve things. Thing is that this was my first ever um, conference talk. Moreover, this was the first talk of this kind that I gave on a language that is not my native Serbian language, so feedback is much appreciated. Thank you. That's it. Any questions? Do we have a microphone? Okay, so uh, 
In one of your examples at the beginning of the uh, how Can you speak should, louder? Yeah. yeah. Uh, how we should format the exception messages. Okay. Uh, you showed us an example uh, with uh, passing an uh, article ID, if I remember, you remember well. Yes. Uh, and putting it into the message, actually. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, and what if the value will be null? Will that change our, maybe, could it change the meaning of our exception? Uh, my point is about, uh, shouldn't we use quotation marks? Just to make developers sure that there should be a value and it's actually no, for some reason. So you're saying that uh, if that input ID that you're passing to the named constructor is null? Yeah, in the message. Uh, and sometimes, you know, the exception message but that's a different exceptional condition, right? Someone didn't pass ID <coughs> to your method, right? Yeah, exactly, but it's not impossible, right? Uh, yeah, it's, no, I mean... Sure, so my point is about, uh, you know, just to make other developers that work with our code easier, uh, shouldn't we use quotation marks around values that we put in messages that are in exceptions? Okay, so you're now talking ab about templating issues, or, or is that so? But as you've seen, we also talked about um, uh, passing null into methods, and I disallow that by making everything mandatory, right? Yeah, that's true, but uh, if someone is, for example, maintaining a legacy code, right, uh, it will be difficult to implement all what you said, actually, so this is, for me, a small improvement that will make other developers' life easier. Okay, yes, I agree. So you agree? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Let's say that we agree. your presentation you mentioned about uh, repository methods which return no uh, which is inconvenient for developers because they need to add additional uh, conditions against those new additional methods. checks against nuts yes. yes and then you your solution was to uh, throw an exception but you need to catch this exception anyway yeah so but um, so and the question is why uh, such approach in your opinion, is easier than... In my opinion, try catch as a structure is a much more, um, how would I say, um, much, it looks much more nicer, it looks much more um, cleaner. It's a more meaningful way for expressing your intents into code as opposed to null checks, right? So to me, a try-catch block is a much more meaningful structure if you are about to, to do try-catch immediately, right? And what, what do you think about controlling uh, application flow uh, using exceptions? Because uh, you somehow do that, right? I know what you're ref referring to and I don't think that's good, yeah. I would not use exceptions for that particular use case, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, uh, you actually do that. Uh, in your repositories, you change the application flow for an exception. Yes, but I'm letting that exception to propagate all the way to my exception handler, and the thing and the execution stops there, right? Does that make sense? So I'm not catching that exception immediately after I I throw it. I'm not catching it in line. I'm. I'm letting my exception to propagate all the way to the error handling system, central error handling system, right? So do you mean that your repository actually decides about... But if you, if you saw that other example, um, at repository layer, I'm using special case always. <coughs> On a service layer, right, I'm, I'm throwing exceptions and I'm not catching them manually, um, explicitly, right? but I'm letting them go through all the way to my exception handler. 
and I manage all the, the, the errors from that single place. So basically, from your repository, you decide to uh, display to the user uh, not found uh, uh, message? That all depends. Uh, that was just a naive example, right? You can do uh, things that way, right? To um, let everything works as expected, right? To render user a page. So instead of article title, he would see not found. Instead of a content, he would see a link to go back to return to home page. But from a, a practical point of view, that does not make any sense from, for example, in terms of um, SEO optimization, because a browser, a robot, is going to get a 200 OK, and you showed him a not found error, right? So that's why if you have a business rule in your application that says article must not exist, that must be 404, right? In that case, I'm controlling that business rule by throwing exceptions on a service layer, OK? And does so, it, doesn't it feel for you like, like uh, mixing uh, responsibilities? I mean, in what sense? Uh, you somehow put uh, like a, like a part of your template of your layout uh, to the exception class, and then you like I said, it. that special case was just a naive example. I would not do uh, things that way in, uh, for for that particular use case. That was just to show you alternatives for returning nulls, right? So which approach you, you're going to use, throwing an exception or returning a special case, that's based on the use cases that you have in your application and business requirements. Okay, thank you.